Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Grand Rounds. Today, 6th of July, my name's Tom Farden and I'm the um, mainly absent uh, chair of Grand Rounds. Um, but I'm, it's either exciting to you or hugely depressing that I'm back uh, off my three months of sick leave. And hopefully all things going well. I'll, I'll, that's me here for the next 25 years. Um, so, it is nice to be back. Uh, it's nice to see the smiling faces out there. And uh, we are recording um, we're we're um, live streaming to Perth. Hello, Perth. They're waving. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, we also had, had some requests to live stream to the radiology department, which I accept. And it is only 200 yards that way, but they want to live stream to there, so we're going to be doing that. And also live streaming to the Perth radiology department. So if you're listening to this recording after, uh, after, after the fact, and you think you'd like to live stream, then let us know, because we can do it. We have the power. We have the technology. Um, uh, there has been a bit of a, of, a, of a lag with the Grand Round presentations on the archive, but I'm assured by the university that that will all be fixed before the end of the month and you'll be able to see all the Grand Rounds back uh, until 2014. Right, so, uh, I could stand here and tell you about the excitement of the Tour de France and the finish at the top of Le, uh, Planche de la Belle Fille, but what I'm going to do um, is just crack straight on with, uh, with today's uh, presentations. Uh, Cliff Bartham is going to do the majority of this. You won't have to endure me for very long. But when he emailed me a few weeks ago and asked if we could have a presentation on um, uh, anticipatory care plans, I jumped at the chance because um, in respiratory medicine, we have a lot of patients who either do have anticipatory care plans or should have them uh, but don't, and then we have problems with them because they're either not read or they're ignored or they're changed or, they, or people just don't know about them. So I've got a couple of cases here um, where hopefully I think an ACP might have helped and then Cliff's going to talk about whether I'm right or not and what he's going to do about it. So here's the patient, who's JK. Uh, JK is, is, is not that JK, but is a 72-year-old woman who I've known for a long time. The department has known her for ages. She has very bad COPD and she's got bronchitis as well. She's very overweight, which is a big problem for a lot of our patients because they lose a lot of fitness uh, and they lose a lot of reserve. She's also a very anxious woman. She's a very intelligent woman um, who uh, gets very anxious about all her symptoms, asks a lot of questions, um, uh, and is quite difficult to manage uh, in many regards. So she comes in, or she was coming in and out quite a lot, was JK, um, increasingly poor on discharge. So we do notice this, that we get the patients as well as we can get them, but that is increasingly more poor. So... The first time they come and we get them better, they go home 100%. The next time it's only 95%, then it's 90 then it's 80 And increasingly, we, we worry that if that's the best she's at, she'll be back in again. And lo and behold, she's coming in more frequently. But the problem is she's not coming in with exacerbations due to infections. She's coming in because she's increasingly poor and her condition means she can't cope at home. So increasingly, it's just that the weather's a bit cold or she can't cope with something or she's, her foot is a bit sore. It's not generally her chest that's making her worse. So she, um, she goes to a clinic uh, in general practice, and um, the general practitioner is EF. You, you might just work out who EF is um, if you know who my wife is. Um, and uh, EF is very good at GP. Um, she does all the, uh, the chronic disease management for this woman, gives her lots of psychological support, spends a lot of time with her, um, and she's able to speak to secondary care very easily over dinner or breakfast or, or, or dare I say, a pillow. Um, so she talks to um, the, uh, this, this patient's uh, secondary care physician quite a lot and we really try to come up with a plan of what's going on. But of course in general practice you don't always see your own GP, you see different GPs and they've got different ideas and, uh, and, things, uh, and things bounce around a bit. So anyway, it comes to a to TF clinic um, and TF, her consultant, sees her every two months um, and increases her treatment to maximum levels. This is a different JK. This is JK Simmons. I, I ran out of JKs. Um, uh, and uh, she's on maximum treatment. And by this point, I'm getting lots of emails, but not necessarily from EF, but from the partners in the practice saying, what do I do about JK? What should I do next? Can I do this? Can I do that? And all this is bouncing around, communication happening through lots of different channels, um, none of it really being documented anywhere because it's all a bit informal um, and it doesn't really work very well. So there's all this email advice, lots of different GPs, nothing goes in the notes, and it leads to significant frustration um, at, at clinic appointments. 
And, and then, uh, finally, JK says that she wants treatment at home. She doesn't want to come to hospital anymore. She's had enough of all that. She doesn't think it makes any difference. She wants to be at home. So EF says, that's fine. Let's change our tactic towards symptom control and talk about how we can improve things at home. Discusses it with her consultant. Um, and we all agree that this is a good idea to try to keep her at home. And the options, we discuss this over a cup of tea and think, well, palliative approach, symptom control... How do we keep her at home? We try to think outside the box. This is a bit unusual. So we decide that what we're going to do is give her a nebulizer at home, give her basically hospital at home treatment, um, so that when she is unwell, she can have the nebulizer, have her treatment, but stay in hospital and see how things go for the 24, 48 hours. Problem is that she comes to clinic, and I'm away because I've been off sick, and unfortunately there's been no real communication back to hospital, and there's nothing in the notes, and it's all a bit woolly, and JK comes to see her, comes to see my, one of the registrars, and she says, right, I'm here for a nebulizer. Give me a nebulizer. And we don't give out nebulizers to anybody without a really, really good reason for it. And the communication wasn't there, the patient was very frustrated, um, and I got it in the ear uh, over tea the next day. So... This is, I mean, this, I take a big, sh I shoulder a huge amount of blame for all this because I didn't document it properly. It all went through informal channels, and, and this is one of the problems you have when you're married to the GP of the patient you're looking after, and perhaps well, that shouldn't happen. You sh maybe we should do something about that. But the point of this is that there was no uniform system to put all this into. Uh, patients themselves are hugely unreliable. They don't, they, they filter the information, but we're unreliable as well. Um, and would an easily accessible ACP really have helped for this woman? It's not because ACPs are not just for people who are about to die. They're for people who, where you change, change the, the tack of treatment. And then as I was um, walking uh, up the stairs today, I heard from one of my pharmacy colleagues about a case that happened just yesterday. This is a man with metastatic lung cancer who has no further treatment options. He's exhausted all his treatment options. Um, and he feels less well in the community. The GP goes out and checks his bloods for whatever reason. He's got a potassium of eight and a half. So a different GP in the practice is phoned with that result, calls an ambulance. On the face of it, not that unreasonable. But the patient doesn't want to come to Nine Wells. He's had enough. He doesn't want any more treatment. And he said, I don't, I'd like to live out my days at home, even if it means dying tomorrow, which is a perfectly reasonable, informed decision to make. However... He was taken to Nine Wells, went to AMU, was treated for his AKI, and then the next day when the consultant saw him and said, well, if you want to be at home, we'll transfer you home. But that meant a palliative ambulance, and that's a hospital stay, that's again, which is all against his wishes. So the patient knows what they want, the patient's own GP knows what the patient wants, but the other GPs that took the blood and results didn't know. And there's this frustrating thing for us that um, you can put what you like in a patient's key information summary and make an ACP, but the ambulance control folk can't read it because they're not clinical. They don't have the permissions on the screen to be able to read it. So this patient had a very good um, ACP on their KISS, but the ambulance control people couldn't read it. So they couldn't turn around and say, well, actually, this chap never wants to go to hospital. So in this case, the ACP was ignored. So those are just two cases in living, recent living memory, uh, one very recent, where things have gone wrong and we could certainly have done things better. So I'm hopefully Cliff is going to stand up now and I'll negotiate the technology um, and he's going to tell us about work that he has been doing about integrating ACPs into Portal. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tom. I was going to tell you uh, a little bit about the background of ACPs, the purpose of them, who should have one, uh, what might trigger one? Uh, why you know, don't we have ACPs already? Why do we need another one? Um, why put it in portal? And then I'll, I'll show you what we've got in the in the test system that that should be coming through later this summer. Um, I'd then like to talk a little bit about some work that was done in Scotland, showing how you can use the ACP to actually really make a difference to patient care and and costs. I have some questions. For the floor, so I'm looking for, for clinicians to help guide us in, in, into how we how we approach making the ACP available. And then Thomas jumped the, the, the gun by doing his case illustrations first, so we can we can tick that one off. So what's an anticipatory care plan? Well, that's a that, that's a terrible slide, isn't it? I should have gone to a presentation skills course before I put that up, shouldn't I? But that's that's what's on the uh, the Scottish government website. So that's their different definition of what an anticipatory care plan is. But it's basically a plan of what happens following a crisis or a deterioration in the patient's uh, condition. 
And it has details of uh, who to contact, what self-management plan uh, could be in place, such as a home nebulizer for, for t Tom's patient there, how care could be escalated. There's instructions for healthcare and, and carers in terms of what to do. There's a, a record of a preferred place of care for the patient. So in this case, the patient uh, wanted to stay at home in, in, in Tom's second case. And <clears throat> depending on, on how the disease process or the condition the patient has progressed, there might be further things such as preferred legal actions, whether there's a welfare power of attorney that's been set up and whether that's activated, whether there's continuing power of attorney. And where appropriate, it may include end-of-life decisions such as the degree of escalation of, of treatment and whether or not CPR is appropriate. So as Tom said earlier, for some patients, uh, this anticipatory care plan is more like an individualised treatment guide. And then for others, at the part of care side of things, it's more like an end-of-life treatment decisions plan. The important thing is that it's created in discussion and agreement with the patient. So knowing what the contents are, and you'll, you'll see it later, and I'm sure you're, at least some of you will be aware of, of, of the ACPs that are out there already, you'll know that often these are filled in in a multi-professional way. So more than one profession may well need access to the same document and be contributing towards it. So that makes it a very special kind of, of living document. Another important thing is it's kept current, so it must be updated and reviewed regularly, and I think the minimum recommendation at the moment is, is at least annually. So the purpose, here's another shot from the uh, Scottish Government website. The purpose of it, it's very simple. It's thinking ahead so that carers and healthcare staff do the right actions in a crisis or deteriorating situation in accordance with the patient's wishes. So it's all about patient-centred care, maintaining dignity, maintaining patient choice and maintaining patient control. So in other words, this is patient-centred, realistic medicine put into practice. So who should have one? Well, I think Tom's illustrated that quite nicely with his, uh, his, his, his two cases. So at the one end, he's got a patient who's got um, uh, a with a patient with com a complex or difficult to treat uh, con condition and in my own practice I can think of a few neurology patients that have had unusual conditions where they've appeared in A&E some of the frequent flyers have been, have, have been well known and the particular clinic letter which, which details what to do if the patient presents to A&E has been put to the front of the notes but what if you don't have that, what if the notes aren't there you know, what would happen then, would the patient get the best, the best care uh, patients receiving palliative care should have an anticipatory care plan and patients with end-of-life care needs. But it obviously depends on some form of clinical assessment as to how appropriate an ACP is and whether the patient's ready to engage in an ACP discussion process. There are some triggers which should sort of alert us to think about putting an ACP in, in place. So some of these triggers could be situational, so a patient who's housebound or in receipt of a complex care package, someone who's recently moved into a care home, somebody who's had a, an unscheduled admission and they, they're flagged up as being a, maybe as a frail person, people who have frequent contacts with out-of-hour services, respite care, and so on. These are situations where you might think maybe an anticipatory care plan would, would help us manage this patient better. The condition is also a factor here. So what is physically wrong with the patient? Do they have an advanced long-term condition such as COPD or chronic heart failure? There's the chronic, uh, sorry, there's the complex or unusual condition such as the, so some of the, the weird neurological things we might, we might see. Or even just something that's common but because of patient factors is difficult to treat and then an ACP might be invaluable in those circumstances. And as we all get older, there's obviously things like dementia and memory clinics. These are potential triggers that uh, might make the clinicians think, maybe I should talk to the patient about having an anticip anticipatory care plan here. And lastly, there's clinical assessment. So there's 
There's your frequent flyer patients, the ones that are in and out of the clinic, the ones that seem to be deteriorating. Perhaps they should have um, an ACP. Patients that you recognise as frail or vulnerable due to changes in their health or declines in their cognitive function, perhaps an anticipatory care plan would be something to think about while they're still able to do it. Uh, maybe the patient's on multiple drugs, and maybe they're taking certain categories of drugs such as opioids, that might ring a little bell to say, oh, maybe it's an anticipatory care plan would be the way to go. But we have anticipatory care plans already. We've got at least three that you can access from Clinical Portal just now. There's the palliative care summary, there's the key information summary, and in some cases there's, a, there's an old uh, Midas ACP form that, 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 that can be found. The problem with these is for the KISS and the ACP, right access to those is from GPs only. The benefit is that these are national systems. So if you get cross, uh, cross-boundary patients coming in, you can still access their, their KISS and their PCS because it's part of the ECS system. That's the emergency care summary. There's another one that comes from the GP systems. But the difficulty is it's almost impossible for secondary care, um, mental health, and some community areas to actually get information into that uh, key information summary. And I know areas such as palliative care have tried writing to the GPs to say, please could you include this information in your, in your, in, in your KISS? And sometimes some of it gets through, but quite often it doesn't. And then, as Tom was saying, quite often you'll, you'll find patients who, who present to A&E and you think, why doesn't this patient have a key information summary? Because clearly this patient's been, been deteriorating for quite a long period of time, but it's not there. And we have to prompt the GPs to do it. Will they do it? Or do they have time? Would it not be so much better if we could do it ourselves? And the Midas ACP is essentially uh, going because it's a, it's, it's a dead-end system. So the new anticipatory care plan that's going in there, to, to, in, in, in addition to these, we're going to put in clinical portal. Um, and the sound reasons for that. I can tell you're probably all thinking, well, why don't we just have one anticipatory care plan? Surely that would be the best thing. We should have one anticipatory care plan. We all operate it. The GPs can, can, can write their bits in it. We can write our bits in it. And, of course, there's one person that, that, that's missing from this equation, isn't it? and that is, where's the patient input into this? Well, the poor patient has to sit and tell somebody else what they want, and they can type it into the system for them, whether, whether that's clinical portal or whether that's... Um, That's the the GP key information system or the palliative care summary. So there's a huge piece of of national work that needs to be done to get patient portals up and running. And I know they are working on that already. And as soon as that's there, then I would hope that we'd start to see uh, a mechanism so that patients can actually start to engage and actively contribute towards anticipatory care plans themselves too. But that's not where we are at the moment. So we have to do the least worst option. So at the moment, we can't, we can't uh, write an ACP and have it immediately available. But if we put it in clinical portal, we know that clinical portal is used by secondary care. We know that primary care use it. We know that mental health have it. And we know that community can use it too. So it's immediately available to, to, to all these healthcare areas. The other thing that we do know is with the technology for clinical portal, we can actually tailor that, the view. So we can take out an awful lot of the, the medical stuff, such as results and letters and so forth. We can take those out and give a tailored view of clinical portal, which means that we can then think about sharing it with local authority staff as well. And that's, you know, they're, they're an important uh, component to an anticipatory care plan for delivery that at, at the moment is, is, is probably missing. So I'll move on and I'll show you the development system. So this is the development system. Hopefully you can, it's projecting okay. These are all um, test patients, so there's no real data. You can probably tell that by the names. Got the, the usual, so I'll move this. The usual uh, navigation um, bars on, on, on the left-hand side. So I'm just going to select a patient. Uh, if I go into Christopher Golf, he's our test patient, poor old Christopher Golf, despite being in his 70s, has a child protection message, and I think despite being male, he's had several procedures done in the past in gynae and so forth, so it's, it's real rubbish test data. 
So here's where you would find the anticipatory care plans normally. So here's the new one. That's the ACP link in the left-hand column. If you can see where my mouse cursor is on the left. We've got the emergency care summary, which a lot of us will be, will be familiar, which just gives us demographics, drugs, and allergies. There's a key information summary, which has got special notes and care notes and DNA, CPR, and a lot of other stuff in it, which comes from the primary care system. Underneath that, there's the palliative care summary, which, if you like, is a palliative care targeted version of a, an anticipatory care plan. So let's go into the, the test ACP. And there's two permission types for the anticipatory care plan. There's viewing the anticipatory care plan, and then there's permission to edit the anticipatory care plan. And it, it may be that those groups of people need to be different, and we can have a discussion about that later. So if I click on view, that will bring me up. I'll see if I can make this screen a bit bigger. Oh. Sorry, I'll just log in again. That's the joy of working with test systems. Mm. So you can tell it's real. So I'll not try maximizing the browser again, but this is a, a, a printable version of the anticipatory care plan. It's just a standard PDF, contains all the details you'd expect to see in, a, in an anticipatory care plan. And at the end, you can see there's a, there's a little bit of the, the full audit trail that sits behind this electronic system. So you can see, who, in this case, who the last five contributors were to, to the ACP. And the most recent one tells you really when it was last updated. So that's the, that's the viewable and printable version of the ACP. But if we want to edit the ACP, then that's, it's the same information, but it's now presented in an editable form. So you can see you've got patient demographics and contact details at the, at the top. Importantly, there's how to get into the house if you need to. Uh, there's patient contact numbers. You can add other numbers. There's a free text area for describing the current health problem. There's areas for indicating if the patient has a self-management plan, if there's anticipatory medication in place, and the nature of the anticipatory medication, so that's where your nebulizer would have gone, Tom. There's a bit about what the patient understands about their condition. <coughs> and... Importantly, what the family and the carers understand about it too, because they might not be the same. There's an area for detailing the contact detail, uh, key contacts for professionals, next of kin, carers. So they, they all go in here. And if there's others to add, you can. It's it's almost infinitely expandable. There's a legal section here, so whether there's a welfare guardian provided and some details about it, whether there's power of attorney arrangements, whether the welfare power of attorney has been activated and details about that, if there's a guardianship or intervention order that's been initiated, if there's an Adults with Incapacity Act um, issue that's been um, um, activated, and then we're into... Has cardiopulmonary resuscitation been discussed? If so, when? Who was it discussed with? What the outcome was? And has a, CP, a, a DNA CPR form been completed? Yes, no, we don't know. Date. And importantly, where is it? Because uh, if it's held at the patient's home, you need to know where to find it, particularly the ambulance crew do. And then at the end, we've got an SBAR section, which allows, us, if you like, a, a more narrative description of what the situation is, um, what things are important uh, to the patient, what the current areas of concern are, um, and then maybe some details about how the, uh, the management plan is, 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 is going to be delivered. There's a, an area for a preferred place of care, preferred place of death. No one likes to think about that, but it's an important consideration. 
and there's an indication at the bottom of the form as to whether the patient's given agreement that the information can be shared with, with other agencies. Now, none of the fields there are mandatory fields, and we deliberately made it so because an anticipatory care plan is, is often a discussion with a patient that might take several visits before it's in a state where by you'd want to, to share it with others. So you can save it as draft, and saving it as draft means it doesn't get published, but when you go back in, where you start editing again is where you, is, is where you left off. Or if you've got, you know, if part of it's been filled in by a social worker, for instance, for for key key workers and contacts and so forth, but they've left the rest for a healthcare professional to fill in, they could be able to pick up from 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 there and and, and, and fill it in, and you'd be able to see who'd been contributing towards this particular ACP. If you click Save and Publish, what it does is it, it means that that ACP is now the current ACP. So that's the one you see in the read-only view. It's the printable, the, the, the printable PDF view. So you can print that off, you can leave a coffee with the patient, but importantly, when you, when you click Save and Publish, it also sends an electronic copy of that to the GP. Now, the GP can then file it in the system, but what I would hope the GPs would do was they would, it would be a prompt for them to maybe update their key information summary with information that's in our ACP coming from uh, secondary care, mental health and community. The GPs could actually be given right access to this, to this as well, so you know, that, 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 that's up for consideration. So that they could use this. That the, if you like, the, the downside of that would be, although it would be great for Teesside, if the patient decided to go and be ill out with Teesside and have a crisis and it's not in the key information summary, it might not be accessible then. So that's basically it. That's, that's the system. Um, you can ask, you know, what's, what's the point of, of, of doing an anticipatory care plan? Well, I think there's plenty of anecdotal evidence where an anticipatory care plan would have been of benefit for treating an individual patient. Um, I've certainly seen anticipatory care plans that have helped us make decisions about taking patients to intensive care and continuing ventilation and so forth. But you can actually reshape the way you deliver health care in a community around an anticipatory care plan. And it's, it's, it's a, a sort of managed care system, which I know there's lots of studies in, in, in America which us Brits tend to look at and go, well, you've got a different care system, so that doesn't count. But here's a study that was done in 2012, published in the British Journal of General Practice in, uh, by Baker et al., and it was done almost on our doorstep in Nen. And what they did was they got two primary cares and they took a cohort of 96 patients, matched them for age, sex, and morbidity, having first of all put them through a risk stratification tool. So these 96 patients, these were the frequent flyers. These were the guys that were likely to end up, that had a more than a 50% projected chance of ending up as an unscheduled admission. So one group they provided an anticipatory care plan for. Uh, and in addition, they also thought, if we're going to actually deliver this anticipatory care plan, we're not going to be able to do it within the current setup that our health service has. So they actually put together a team that was there to deliver the, the, the ACP. And the other 96 got the standard care. And they followed them up for 12 months. And the results they got are absolutely striking. So the anticipatory care plan cohort had 510 fewer days in hospital once the ACP was in place than they'd had in the 12 months beforehand. And you would expect, as this group were getting older, that they would have got worse in actual fact. They got better. There were 37 fewer admissions uh, from the ACP cohort, so that's, a, uh, so that's a significant reduction of 42%. The mortality rates were about the same, so 16 in the ACP group died and 15 in the control uh, group died in, 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 in that time, but a huge difference in what happened in the last three months of life. Those with the ACP in place uh, spent 134 days in hospital versus the control group that had 308 in the last three months of their life. And that's usually the most expensive uh, piece of, uh, of, 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 of medical cost that, 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 we, that, that we incur. Now, 
putting that team in to look after those people in the community cost money, and it cost £125,000, but that was still almost £19,000 less than the difference in not doing that and, give, and, and giving them control treatment. Um, but it also made a huge difference to the number of beds that, 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 that were occupied. And when they did the maths and scaled this up to the size of a community health partnership population of a, just under 100,000, it equates to a whole ward of medical patients being saved. That's a huge difference. So it, it's, I think that's a, it's, it's a potential beacon to tell us that if we're going to change the way we deliver health care, this is somewhere to look because we've got evidence within Scotland itself that we can do this, it saves money, and it, it, it frees up secondary care beds. So that's what we're planning to release. We're, we're, we're open to feedback and, and, and ideas, but we've also got some questions for you. Read access to the anticipatory care plan, that bit where you can get to the principal view. Uh, we think that's probably uh, something that probably all clinicians should have access to. Write access to the anticipatory care plan, that's something which is a little bit less easy to decide. It's always easier to, to start small and grow big than it is to take things away from people. Should we just give it to the senior clinicians? But then what about district nurses, the nurse specialists, the heart failure nurses, the oncology nurses, respiratory nurse specialists, the Macmillan nurses, other AHPs? There's a lot of people who potentially could, um, could make good use of this AHP and make it do good work for, for the patients. And obviously there's others. And then what about local authority? At some point we need, we need to take them on. And that's where we are. And... To a certain extent, we've stood on the shoulders of giants to, to, to get this portal ACP out because we built it on, on, the, on the MIDAS data set. We put together a local uh, ACP short life working group to, to review the data set, sense check it, see what was happening other places nationally. The data set has, has changed a little bit. We had representation from secondary care, from medicine from the elderly, from palliative care, um, from primary care, e-health input. We sense checked it with uh, the leads from the national ACP group and then our portal development team of the two Stevens and Paul basically put it, put it together. So a lot, of, a lot of thanks to them. So I think what, probably what we need to do is we need to get it out and get it road tested and get some feedback on it. Thank you. I think this is great. Isn't this great? I think, it's, I think it's a fantastic piece of work. It's clearly not the end. It's the start of a sort of iterative process. But um, as, as a physician, and I see that um, since I sat down, there's more physicians filled the room, and, and I'm sure everyone else has the same feeling that you know, we see people all the time who get admitted because you know, against their wishes or against their plan, and, and they come in for reasons that are not medical. They're, we all... You know, um, you know, what was it that... Um, uh, Prof McMurdo said in her final talk here a couple of years ago, she hates the, the, the phrase of social admission. And, um, but that's what we see a lot of. We see a lot of admissions because people have their social structure at home has failed them um, and they end up in hospital. This is, this is a great way to try and combat that. I, I, I applaud you for the, your efforts uh, and the rest of the team that have done this with you. And I, and I think that this is, a, this is really, you know, if you save 30 beds, uh, you can save half of them in the chest ward if you like. That'd be great. Has anyone got any questions or comments? There's lots of people here with, uh, who have a deep interest in this. Yeah. Hello, I'm Fiona, palliative medicine consultant in Nine Wales. So I suppose I've got a comment, which is maybe just a bit of a bugbear of mine, and then two questions. So my comment is that the point of and I know people know that, but the point of ACP is to benefit our patients. So I think we have to be mindful that some ACP discussions will result in hospital admissions because that's what a patient wishes. So to present data that's purely on reducing bed days is, is, needs to be also considered alongside that. I think my second thing is just to know how this fits in. I, Probably some of my colleagues here know more about this than myself, but I think the Scottish Government have launched an ACP plan which also includes a downloadable app for patients and how that fits in with this. 
And the other comment is when it comes, and Elaine's downloaded it, and when it comes to the box about where the DNA CPR form is in the House, I struggle to understand why that's relevant if it's been discussed with a patient and a family and it's recorded electronically, but why are we still relying on someone finding a paper form in someone's house at a point when someone's presumably terribly symptomatic? It just doesn't seem to... There seems a disparity between the electronic work we're doing and still looking for a paper copy at home. Yeah, and uh, I would agree with all of that. Um, but that's, that's where we are at the moment. The, uh, the ACP app that's out, I think that's a, a, good, work, a good step forward, but it, the problem is it doesn't connect to anything. So it's on the patient's phone, which is great, but how do, how do I see it as a clinician? How do I know it's there? It's, it's, it, it's not been well thought out, and I've been quite disappointed with what the, the national ACP group have produced in terms of the paper document as well. It is a mega tome. It's about 30 pages or, some, or, 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 or so long. It's, it, it's, uh, it, it's got all the hallmarks of being put together by a committee without enough thought in terms of let's just try and make it a practical document. If you can't get it down to two sides of A4, I think they should forget it uh, personally. The, the ACP app would be great if they, if they plug it into something. So if nationally they come out with a way of taking the information out of the ACP app and putting it into an extended version of the key information uh, summary and making that available to us. I'll quite happily walk away from the, uh, the, the, the portal ACP, but I suspect that's quite a long way off at the moment. I, I've... So what are you saying? Is it something about passwords? Of course, yes. I, I had to. I had to um, peer over Elaine's shoulder to work out a passcode to get into it. So, <laughs> so how is the poor physician supposed to see it as well when the patient's unconscious, pointing towards the phone because they've had a stroke? Doesn't they got? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Wait, I've got the microphone. Elaine Henry's going to from GI is going to take over. I do a lot of hepatology. We've. We recognise we have lots of people who come in frequently. They come in out of hours. They come in often for conditions that are acute on chronic. And we know that when people develop decompensated cirrhosis over a two-year period, they will spend often more time in hospital than out. So I then got the national, the, the NHST side. It was in paper form, anticipatory care plan, and found it was just it was like a snowball. There was lots of bits being stuck onto it. There was a bit of demographics. There was an S bar that didn't link into anything else. So I wrote my own but wrote it as a patient-held A4 document, a booklet, that is, gives information for patients and carers, as in what's happening to me, what will happen if I do this, things to look out for for families, because that was something we got lots of feedback. What do I do when he at three in the morning is putting the dog in the fridge? Acute confusion. And people get admitted out of hours. As CITES, we've tried to use lots of different ways of coming in. And, and we've actually given it, so there's lots of information for patients. They can refer to it, written in very plain English. Um, and I suppose it's knowing how do I get this, because I'm aware it's a paper form, but it, it's not password protected. It's in the house. It can be shown to the ambulance team, and it's there. Um, how do I then get this on here so that other people can see it? And we want this to be a two-way document. It's got information we can write in. We can hand it back to the, to the patients, to the GP, as long as it doesn't get lost, that's a problem of it is. But and I think we, we've, we would be extremely keen to get this in. We're really bad at telling people they're going to die. They don't have cancer, but their prognosis is often as bad, and their unpredicted admissions, they come into 15. So we're really keen to, to get this there, and we have a, a document that we would love to try and meld into this, maybe rather than shoehorn or pour in. Well, once we get it out, I mean, you, you can see how it fits with, 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 with your service. And I, and I guess the, the problem with paper and also the problem with even if you dictate uh, a, an ACP at the moment and, and, and send it through you know, digital dictation that ends up in, 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 in clinical portal in the, in the document store area there, what happens is it's then under a specialty and then other letters become you know, on top of it. And then unless you know it's there to look for it, you'll never find it, whereas... If, if we've put it so it's clearly labeled an ACP, there's only one current version. 
even though you know, underneath there's a, there, there is a full version control system so we can see what the ACP has looked at at every single stage if we need to, if, you know, if, if, there's, if, if there's some need to, to investigate what's gone on around an ACP or, or whatever. That, that's all there, but it means that the, you know, the current version of the ACP is, is immediately available. Um, Gordon McClay, I'm a GP out in rural Perthshire. Um, we're struggling with this a lot out in the community, and I applaud your attempt to try and get the communication between primary and secondary care improved. Um, my concern is that we're at the moment um, filling in anticipated care plans, mostly in care homes. We've tried very hard in our practice. We have four care homes we're responsible for, um, and the one I, I visit, we've tried very hard to get them to use a standardised form. Um, but even within the four care homes we have, they use different forms. Our one is using the NHS Tayside form that is valid at the moment, but there is a new document that's come out from, from Scottish Government. The problem we have then is how to then put that into the notes. We've then got to manually transfer that in. We have to scan it in. They have to keep a copy in the, in the care home as well for when people come out to visit. We have to somehow summarise it into the KIS and into the emergency care summary. So it's incredibly labour intensive to get all of that information in. And my concern is that with what you're doing, which is really important, is we're going to end up with two anticipatory care plans. We're going to end up potentially for some patient, one coming from secondary care, although you'll send us an electronic copy, and one which the care homes have developed with the patient in the care home or sometimes at home, which they have a copy of, and they'll say, well, which is the right one? Which one should we use? And that's a slight concern for me is we're coming at it from both ends. And, and the study that was done seemed to suggest that where they invested the effort in the community, that's where the actual savings were made. If you actually got people out there with people and got them to fill them in and think about their future, that's where you actually made the savings. So although I applaud what you're doing, I think we need to be more joined up in how we actually make this happen. And I think the problem we have is actually finding the time to sit down with people and actually have these difficult discussions. It's easier in care homes, actually, because the care home staff help us do that. But at home, even with chronic patients, we're seeing week after week, month after month, to sit down and actually say to them, look, things aren't going well, as you do in hospital, and actually get them to make those realistic decisions about the future is actually very difficult, even with multiple visits. And trying to get them to commit to something on paper is quite difficult. Yeah, I, I, and I would agree with that. It sounds as though you, you've actually got the worst of all worlds because you've got the key information summary, which is an electronic system that plugs into in, into your electronic health record that, that, you, that you use. So it should it should be nice and quick and, and easy to, to to update it and have the information immediately available. And yet, you still have to do a paper ACP as well. So you end up doing it twice because the paper that's in the care home, you know. The, Paper has a habit of, of either getting lost or not being available where it's required. Um, and if you let those two things get out of sync, then, well, then what happens if things go wrong? You know, where's the accountability there? So I agree. I, we desperately need to get towards a single ACP for, for the whole of Scotland, in fact, is what we need. We need, we need a national system. But that's, that's not where we are. And at the moment... We've got all these bits, but secondary care have got a bit missing. But I'm not, I'm not precious about what we do in the portal. I'll quite happily um, say, right, we've got this national system. Let's put what we've got into the national database so we're not starting from scratch, and then let's just use the national system once it's up and running. But it's not there. So at the moment, you, you, you've got a whole lot of healthcare professionals that are disenfranchised from the, from the ACP conversation other than writing, you know, begging notes to the GP saying, please, would you put this in the key information summary? And, and you know, sometimes it does get in, but, but quite often it doesn't. Yeah, I mean, try, trying to get permission to write directly into, into GP systems from secondary care, that's a minefield we've tried to navigate a few times. And there's, there's the forward-thinking GPs that are really keen for us to do that, and then there's others which say, no, over my dead body. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Like, you need to be recorded for posterity. You can't, uh, you can't get away with just shouting, Craig. Crikey. So I'm Craig. I'm also a GP. I think 
I would say that anyone that I speak to doesn't actually like KISS. It's, it's populated straight from the GP record, but GPs don't actually like it. So I think what you've made looks better, but it's only worthwhile if everyone uses the same one thing. Because like you've mentioned all the, the flaws of having two systems, three systems, whatever. If, if, if everyone isn't working from the same thing, I think it's almost pointless. And that's the benefit of putting in But GPs proposal. don't actually like KISS. They just, it's yeah. the only thing that links. But that's if you just took KISS away and everyone used that one, I think that would work better. Yeah, and, and, and the key information summary was a, a system designed by GPs. So there you go. I mean, that, 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 that tells you everything, doesn't it? You'll never, ever please everyone, even when you've got an, an in-house development. And the reason we, we, we've put it in clinical portal is because the key information summary and the palliative care summary and the ACP all sit together now in clinical portal, so they're all there. And yes, it's messy because there's three of these things to click on, but it's better than having no information at all, and it's better than not being able to contribute at all. So if, although we've got a suite now, potentially, of, 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 of three different electronic systems, plus the paper that's out, that's out there in, 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 in the care homes, I, I think it's a, it's a step forward towards eventually, hopefully, getting a single system that we all use. It's me again. Sorry. I didn't realise all this was recorded or just stayed quiet. <laughs> I, think, I think having this in clinical portal is, you know, it, it will be really useful, but I'm sitting here and thinking... It, it seems like from advanced care planning, we're still where we were many years ago and, and it's still not joined up. And the paper that you present and the other things, you know, if, if, if we as, you know, in healthcare are buying into anticipatory care planning as a good thing and a useful thing, then it's really frustrating that at a high level they aren't providing some funding to have people transfer that information from different areas, be it a clinic letter, be it notes, be it whatever, that there's not some system that represents that information on whatever electronic system there is. And maybe that's a very naive idea, but, you know, it's really... And I'm sure many people here will share the frustration. So I've just had a discussion with a 31-year-old woman with metastatic colorectal cancer with lots of very complex discussions about her wishes for her future care. And how do I convey that? So at the moment, as a hostile palliative care team, I would do that by dictating a letter, verifying it, having it in portal, and highlighting, probably through a phone call and in that letter, to primary care, could they update a key information summary, which I think is my only route to do that at the moment. But a response to an out-of-hours team or a team that don't know her, it's then so dependent on that information getting into a key information summary, which might not happen for all the reasons you've suggested, not because people aren't willing, and people might not access the letter that we've done, and then something might happen to this young woman and her family, which was just not what they wished at all, and that just still, all these years down, doesn't seem that we've come all that far. Yeah, except you could put all that in a in an online portal ACP that would. Okay, be Perth, we know you're there. We know you're there. Sorry, she's been waving desperately. She'll be next. Don't worry. Sorry, Karen. So, so it, it would be it would be available, and, and the beauty of it being available in clinical portal is it can be available. To, you know, the, the GP can see it in portal as well as, as getting it posted into their Docman work, work stream, uh, and it's it, it's available wherever the patient pitches up for healthcare within an NHS tier side then it's immediately available and it's accessible so I, I would say that that is a step forward and it's not going to be hidden so your, your dictated letter that with, a, with a plea to say please put this in the, in the key information summary it is relatively straightforward for the GPs to do it because the, 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 the way, certainly the, the way we send the, um, the ACP through is it, 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 there's a format called TIFF the tagged image format that they can highlight and they can cut and paste um, and they can workflow and, and, and that's how, how we send it to them but it's, it's, it's time and it's, 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 it's actually, you know, the, the GPs get so much, so much in the, in the way of mail that they often sort of, they, they speed re read stuff and they get used to the format in which things come through so sending them a, a standard letter format where they know where to, where to find key things is, is, is usually the best way to get information into their system where it needs to go and I would hope that you know, eventually the ACP would be one of these things where they'd know, right, 
I can I can speed read this because that's where the DNA CPR stuff is. If I look down there, and here's where the the, the details are, and here's where the the, the actual self care plan is, and, and and so forth. So maybe standardising will actually improve the the transfer of information into the key information summary as well. Right, Perth apparently has been waving desperately. On you go. trial will be, it'll be launched and made available to certain clinical groups um, So it will be, could be, because we, just, we will just put it in the next live release of Portal with, uh, with the communications plan that goes around it. Uh, I, I do also know that, uh, I mean, this is the first group that have actually, that have actually seen it, the, um, you know, the, the, the demo system. That, uh, the, the, the national group, I think, are, are very, very keen to see what we've done as well uh, and I'll need to take it around and, and, and show them shortly as well. Right, well that has stimulated lots of discussion um, and I, I'm sure that will be helpful to Cliff and his team to take away and if you, you uh, have more things you'd like to speak to him about I'm sure he'll hang around a little bit at the end. Thank you to Cliff for your question from Perth. Sorry it took me ages to see you. Um, and there is no time at all for me to discuss the hilltop finish of yesterday's Tour de France or, or even discuss any movies. So next week, uh, round round, I've completely forgotten who is next week, but I'm sure they'll be marvellous. So uh, do come again next week. Look out for the email with interesting tidbits of interesting factoids, and I'll see you next week. Thanks so much to Cliff, and thanks to everyone for taking part in the discussion. Shh.